sent through, but I don't really know. Oh, goodness. Well, like, if you go look on the archive, you can see how far you've gone through. I was honestly surprised how much I burned through in a single night. What What yeah. are you What are you people talking about? It's an excellent little webcomic made by a person from St. Louis about bootlegging cats. That's utterly delightful. <laughs> like, like, if I explain it to you, it will sound like the dumbest thing ever. Well, but... But it is. But the art's fantastic. It's really funny, and it's just a lot of fun. Well, John, oh my God, volume two. Jesus. Well, John, I've told you repeatedly that both a show about a talking horse who was on a '90s sitcom and a show based on a true, uh, a yeah. true life ladies wrestling program are two of the best shows on television. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, this web com- yeah, That's. A, I think that's part of like why it's so utterly enthralled because like this screen this kind of premise screams like kids thing but it's still like the characters cuss and like it's and there's like and everyone's murdering people all the time it, it is like an anthropomorphized more comedic goodfellas <laughs> it has like it has like a shockingly earnest depiction of the of the crime world <laughs> i'm looking now and it looks like it got halfway through volume two yeah, yeah, it's That's volume it, one. You, can, you can just like, burn through this comic. It's like it, I, I'm honestly surprised just how much I like it. Uh, what's your favorite character so far, Reed? I, I just need to know. Ah, uh, shit! I forget its name. Oh shit! <laughs> I, 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 I'm ride or die for Rocky. Mm, He's just got so much enthusiasm. And he laughs while he burns down a, a, a rival bootlegger's farm. <laughs> See, I'm not the same way because I really like Calvin. <laughs> oh, oh, the, oh, just the little wide-eyed, like, I am in over my head and I am ashamed that I am a criminal. <laughs> yes. There's always one of those. Of course. Well, that's the best part. Like, every once in a while you'll get, like, these really, like, somewhat profound musings on the criminal world and like the dichotomy of like have of like laughing about your work when your work is murdering people well it's fascinating and i love it but it's time for movies yes we don't talk about web comics on this show (laughs) but hey welcome back to the hack fraud show so this is kieslowski week uh part two i guess um because I was very interested to check out uh, two of his non-Three Colors films. Uh, that would be... And, and I was too, to be honest. Yes, that would be yeah. Blind Chance and The Double Life of Veronique. Oui. Both interesting movies in their own way. Both about Poland. Yes, both about Poland, yeah. one kind of about France. Um, yeah. I will say... You got a bit of a thing for both of those. After the uh, pan-Europeanism of the Three Colors trilogy, as you put it, uh, it is very kind of weird to see him, like, make a movie that is very, like, uniquely Polish. Yeah, and so... Yeah. To, no, granted, like, the Pol- the Polish experience during the Cold War could also is also, like, very indicative of the rest of the Soviet bloc. But regardless, especially, like... In, like, The Double Life of Veronique, there's, like, this idea that, like, Eastern Europe is Western Europe, and, like, mm-hmm. these things are all the same, and there are two people who are the same and through different parts of Europe. Uh, I actually, uh, um, quick note, I actually like the, um, the, uh, cinematography of the Poland and that movie as opposed to in, in Blind Chance. But yeah, well, uh, sort of. Regardless, we'll sort of get to that. Like, there's this kind of odd, like Jean Pierre Genet yellow glow to the Poland in Double Life of Veronique. Yeah, uh, very fascinating stuff. We will get to that in a moment. First off, what have we been watching? Well, Tyler, th- this was this was something that's been on my list for a while, but it wasn't until that you watched it where I where I put it up higher. Mm-hmm. Um, I finally watched Amadeus. Ah, yes. Well, what a delightful movie. Oh, well, yes, it's quite delightful. What a delightful... Like, I mean, you say, like, it's a three-hour movie about a rivalry between two 18th-century classic composers, Salieri and the titular Mozart. Yes. But it is, like, this delightful romp through 
the world of like late 18th century Vienna, which is kind of they kind of anachronize into a Baroque LA. Of yeah. sorts. <laughs> it's kind of true. Which is kind of fascinating. And like there's like Salzburg is the kind of like Austrian New York of sorts. Yeah. It's very it's interesting the way they kind of I mean it this movie is in no way like super period accurate. I mean the sets and the costumes oh. are like a very yeah, clearly, like, like they're shooting piece. in like the Staatsopera, yeah, uh, and the, uh, the Hofberg, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but like the the language of the of the movie and like the way the characters act is very much kind of a a more modern uh, sensibility. Very American. Yes. Like there's like the str- there's like the fascinating scene where like they're discussing like what language it's one of Mozart's opera should be yes. Italian or German. And they're all speaking in English, <laughs> and it's the strangest, most delightful thing. Yes. But the story centers around, like, oddly enough, like, it's called Amadeus, but it's far more about Salieri than mm. anything else. Yes. Because, like, it start because, like, he is sort of the framing piece of it. Like, he claims he assassinated Mozart, and is then, like, sent to, like, an insane asylum for, I think, committing suicide is, I think, or what it att- is. Attempting suicide, yeah. Attempting suicide, and then, he, like, a priest comes in, and then Salieri tells this wild tale about, like, his, like, about how he he prayed to God for his talents, and how he was then, he then renounced his faith through meeting Mozart and interacting with Mozart. Mm-hmm. And, like, his life then becomes sort of a game of chicken with the idea of the Catholic God. And it, and it becomes, like, this fascinating parable about, like, how life inspires art and art inspires life. And, like, with just a bit too many scenes of Mozart being down on his on his luck. <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough. Because, yeah, like, I, I, it's kind of strange because, like, Mozart, as constructed by this film, is, like, such, like, a doofus and such just sort of a tool of, mm-hmm. like, Salieri's worldview that, like, yeah. when we just focus on him... I feel like the movie's just wasting its time because, like, yeah. Mozart really doesn't matter. It's all about like how Salieri conceives of Mozart, and like, and like, I think some of the best scenes in the movie were like Salieri's in the box watching mm-hmm. Mozart operas and like both sort of analyzing them as they occur and analyzing ways he could destroy Mozart <laughs> with his own creations. Yeah, well. When I talked so fascinating. To, when I talked about this movie a few weeks ago, I think I remarked that like the the whole movie like seems to be chasing the like perfection of the first hour. Yeah. And to your point, like that that is kind of why. Like when they sh- kind of shift focus like to Mozart's life and like his financial woes and whatnot, the movie just becomes a little less interesting. Yeah. It it you're yeah. right. Like the focus of the movie like should be Salieri and they spend just a little too much time just kind of mm-hmm focused squarely on Mozart. It's a two-hander that doesn't need to be a two-hander. Yeah. I think is where we're we're going at here. But, like, still, like, the two-hander we have is, like, this fascinating, gorgeous musing on art, religion. Yes. And it's full of all my favorite things, Baroque Vienna and people in period costume and, like, lovely, lovely American anachronisms. (laughs) So yeah, like I think this is just like a, a fascinating, fascinating movie. It, and I, it definitely. And is. I think the scene where Sally Airy is helping Mozart write a piece on his deathbed, yeah, is one of my favorite things I've seen in a long time. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's an incredible movie, and I'm glad that it exists. You know the way that it does, even if yeah. perhaps not as great as. Uh, I would have maybe liked it to be, but it, it's still supremely great, and I like, everyone Doug should Walker, see it. This is one of Doug Walker's favorite movies, and he has said the theatrical wa- cut, which we did not watch, is superior. Oh, did he? He, he has said that, so maybe we shall return to this, the theatrical cut. <laughs> I don't know. Like, we, I, you watched the, the director's cut, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. As did I. So, so maybe... Maybe. Perhaps I I just don't know what the point would be of going back. Perhaps if I'm ever rewatching it in the future, I'll watch the theatrical cut instead. Yeah, but yeah, possibly it, it's just sort of it, it's just for the purpose of rewatching it later on when I want some yeah. baroque magic in my life. Well, it's just it's one of those movies where like oddly the director's cut is the more widely available version now. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Well, sometimes that just happens, and like that's the sort of 
we're gonna get into that when we get into the Kieslowski movies, like because yeah. like because the one on Canopy was like a version where they tried to restore it, but like they keep the bits they couldn't restore and just had like a bit that said this part was censored. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, we'll uh, talk about that later. But um, I think oh 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 with um blind chance. Yes. Yeah, with blind chance. Um, yeah, I read something that like it was originally filmed in the early '80s, but because the Polish government were a bunch of dicks, they censored it, and it wasn't released until like yeah. 80. Yeah, but we'll get to that, but, like, that's sort of, this is, like, a not really that, this is more like an issue over Final Cut, and, like, and, like, I don't, I don't know if the, the theatrical version is better, I've been told by some people it's better, but, yeah. regardless, um, Amadeus, I love it. Yeah, I love it, too. I, I think that's all I watched, uh, okay. as far as what I've been watching. All right. Outside of a delightful webcomic like that I discussed earlier. <laughs> Reed, what what have you been putting in front of your face besides uh, delightful web comics? And Vice. <laughs> it was a delightful web comic, wasn't it, Reed? It it is. It's it's not movies, but I do have something um planned to watch. Ooh, what do you? I will I, I, I will withhold the title. Um, <laughs> I plan on watching it in a in a couple weeks. So. Ooh. Okay. Well, that's on the horizon. Reads yes. surprise secret viewing. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'll look forward are, to are it. Are anyone going to see Spider-Man Homecoming? Because like, I'm sort of like thinking of what's coming out. I'm soon. probably going to see it tomorrow, so... I ex- might see it. Expect my thoughts. <laughs> it's probably going to be like something I'm like forced into watching, because like, I really don't want to see it. <laughs> I, I'm going back and forth. I... I guess I'll see it, because I've heard some, like, I, well, I, I don't really trust the critical reviews of Marvel movies anymore, but I I like the idea of a high school movie featuring Spider-Man, so I, I, I'm I hoping yeah. it will not be uh, as ruinous for my opinions as, as Civil I mean, War was. As, like, an artistic opinion, like, I agree that, like, just a high school movie with Spider-Man is a good way to go, but I hate high school movies, so... <laughs> I, I, well, well, I, I, I like I, high school movies, so I uh, I will probably enjoy it. Uh, I hate the trailers for this movie. But... The trailers have been pretty bad. <laughs> the marketing for this movie has really taken a turn. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I, I don't know what um, they're doing. But, but hey, War yeah. for the Planet of the Apes is coming out pretty soon. and Yeah, that, that looks fascinating. Yeah, I'm actually very excited about that. Um, I never saw Dawn. How is that? I enjoyed Dawn quite a bit. I haven't rewatched it since I saw it the first time, but um, I enjoyed it quite quite a bit. And Rise is also pretty good. Yeah, I remember liking. I remember really liking Rise when it came out, though I haven't seen it. Yeah. Since. Yeah, like maybe, maybe I'll. Maybe I'll I, I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen the original Planet of the Apes. So that's I maybe have not. I have to fix. Yeah, I haven't seen any of the movies, so I guess I'll have to partake in those. Well, Regardless, we'll, we'll Tyler, collect that at some point. What have you been watching? What have I been watching? Well, uh, quite by accident, <laughs> I ended up uh, rewatching a movie I, I uh, from my youth. That would be uh, Disney's nineteen seventy three version of Robin Hood. Because <laughs> <laughs> how was it? Was just one of your roommates watching it, and you went, oh, "No, and just no." Sat I, I I wanted to watch the the opening song. I, I got one of those uh, one of those feelings, and I, I decided to watch the the opening of it. And I just kept going because <laughs> I was like, well, might as well just keep on going. I mean, this is a delightful movie, and I just watched the whole thing. So um, it's I feel like it's somewhat underrated. I I enjoy this movie quite quite a bit. Uh, it's not. It's not like an all-time like Disney classic, but uh, I I just enjoy it a lot. It's very fun, and the animation is great, and uh, it's it's just a very like it's a great like delightful romp of a movie. Yeah, well, they, they, well, the seventies are kind of known as the dark age of Disney, mm. like the seventies and eighties as well. So, like, just no, like that era, we just don't talk about. Like, for all <laughs> intents and purposes, like Disney exists only up to the fifties. Skip nineties and then forward. Yeah, <laughs> which is a kind of a shame because I feel like there's some hidden gems in there. Maybe not necessarily like I mean I haven't seen the Black Cauldron or anything, but <laughs> um, that's kind of an infamous one. 
But I don't know. R- Robin Hood is just one that I watched a lot as a kid, and perhaps uh, this is at least partly nostalgia talking, but I I just really enjoy it. Uh, it's it's just got a lot of like delightful things going on, and the music, I really like the music. You know what, like, from, from the clips I've seen, it looks like a lot of fun. Maybe, maybe I will never watch it <laughs> until someone forces me to. Have you ever, have you never actually seen it? No, I've never seen it. Oh, okay, interesting. That was just one, like, that and The Jungle Book were, like, two of the ones yeah. that were maybe, like, in the heaviest rotation when I was yeah. younger. Honestly, like, my early Disney vocabulary is pretty sparse. Mm. Well, you like, had never even think... seen, like, Aladdin until pretty recently, yeah. so... Oh, yeah, well, like... I forgot about that. Anyway, uh, let's see. I also watched Robert Redford's Quiz Show from 1994, <laughs> I believe. This movie... Is interesting. It's it's not great, but it is it is pretty good. It's um so the deal is uh this movie examines the quiz show scandals of the nineteen fifties. Uh, it stars John Turturro and Ray Fiennes. Uh, it uh on the game show um twenty one I believe. Basically, uh John Turturro like he he's a long running contestant on the show and his ratings have plateaued. So the producers tell him to take a dive and like basically and answer a question wrong on purpose. Uh, so Ray fines can win and become the new like, uh, reigning champion. Um, and then they basically, they, uh, they feed Ray fines the answers so that he continues to win every time. So the show can keep getting bigger ratings. And then in comes a man from a uh, congressional oversight committee starting to investigate, uh, the television industry. And, um, it's an interesting movie. It's just, it's a very, it's very fun. And it also kind of serves as an interesting story about the Jewish experience in America because, uh, like John Turturro, like, um, he notes that like, um, uh, the Jewish contestants are always defeated by Gentile contestants on the show. And, uh, <laughs> It's 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 interesting. Uh, so I I recommend Quiz Show. It's not essential by any means, but it's 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 a very it's a fun movie. Yeah, this, this sounds like something I really like. Yeah, I think you would probably enjoy it. It's also just a great like kind of has all the trappings of like nineteen fifties period piece, which I think you would probably be into. Um, and Ray Fiennes. And Ray Fiennes, yes, doing doing an American accent that is not altogether convincing, but uh, <laughs> he's he's doing good work. It's it's okay. His German accent wasn't convincing either in Schindler's List. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. It's okay. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, let's see. I also ventured out to my local uh, multiplex to see a movie called The Big Sick. Uh, have you heard of this? Oh yeah, the, it's what it's those god awful commercials I keep getting on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um. So this Apatow, is... like explains the movie to me. Oh goody. Oh yeah. Oh, how was that? Okay, so uh, this was a movie uh, Kume- written by Kumail Nanjiani and his wife, uh, like basically the story of how they met and got together, um, starring Kumail Nanjiani himself and uh, Zoe Kazan. Uh, fun fact, granddaughter of Aliyah Kazan, director of On the Waterfront and others. Oh, um, interesting. Anyway, uh, so this movie basically follows... Um, Kamal comes from a very traditional, like, Pakistani Muslim family. Uh, he's trying to make it as a comedian in Chicago. He meets this uh, white Christian girl, and they start to have a relationship. She uh, becomes hospitalized by a mysterious illness, and uh, her parents come to town, and Kamal kind of has to uh, grapple with her very concerned and fairly conservative parents. Um, oh, no. So, no, it's... Um, this movie is fine. It's... It is, it is a very, it is very sweet and, um, uh, actually, um, kind of interesting. And Ray Romano and Holly Hunter, like, as the parents are very good. Ray Romano, especially. (laughs) He's, he's very entertaining. My issue with it is that I think this is like the first kind of Apatow produced movie I think I've actually seen. And, uh, I am not a fan of the Apatow kind of brand of, of movie comedy. Like, it's. It's very much of a piece with, like, what I've heard about, like, his other kind of movies. It's, like, you have, like, scenes, like, where, like, the actors are very clearly, like, riffing and, uh, you know, it's, like, pick a joke and go with it. Like, don't have fucking, you know, two minutes of A.D. Bryant just riffing. Uh, Like, this, the scenes, like, there were a lot of, like, scenes in this movie where, like, they'd finish and I'd be like, what? 
was that a scene? Like, was that was that the <laughs> end of the scene? Like, is, is that over? Like, what? And also, it's just like fifteen minutes too long. So it it, it it is, it's a fine movie. And like I say, it is very sweet, and there are good parts. Like, I I really do love Ray Romano's performance in this, but. It also kind of suffers from like the, the 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 flow of the story at the end like really doesn't make sense and it, it's I mean I get that it's based on real life so they probably like stuck closer to that than maybe they should have but it just I don't know the end of it like it all kind of hinges because like they're like before like Emily like goes into the coma like um they kind of have a fight and uh, like they kind of break up and then. Like they never, they don't quite resolve it, obviously, because she's in a coma. And uh, <laughs> uh, and then the the end of the movie, like once she wakes up, uh, spoiler alert, whatever, it, she's alive still, <laughs> it's real life, whatever. Anyway, she um, the end of the movie kind of just is like a roundabout, like I don't know, it, it, uh, it it's too long, it's kind of shaggy and awkward in places. The filmmaking is not that great, but it's it's fine. It's it's a fine movie. It's pretty entertaining. Don't spend fifteen bucks to see it like I did, but uh, maybe. I don't know, from what I'm hearing, like I, I think people un- misunderstand that, like you know, like there is value to improv, but comedy is an art within itself. It's not just something. It's yeah. not just like saying funny things over and over again, right? No, there, there was like there was like a real like fine craft to it, and I don't think people really get that, which is why I think yeah. like these like like fifteen minute improv sessions never work for me. Yeah, it's just like, well, the problem is that they like they don't just like pick one joke; they have it like go on for like you know two minutes at a time, and it just it it is really quite ruinous for the pacing of the scenes and. Like any eighty Bryant and like Bo Burnham like play like or like supporting roles as like fellow like struggling comedians and like I I have no issues with eighty Bryant Bo Burnham I have some issues with but like any time they were on screen I just wanted I was it, it's just it stops the movie cold and I was just like uh so so it it look it's a it's a it's a good premise like for a movie and I I'm glad like they made it but uh, I don't know it's it's not really to my personal comedic tastes. Yeah, like everything, all the commercials around it, they're like, it has like a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, but like the the, the reviews have been mostly like B, B plus kind of stuff, so I'd give it more like a B minus, but uh, anyway, that's the big sick, and then I'll just talk about this briefly, but uh, I plowed, we plowed through the rest of the Harry Potter movies um, oh in the span of a week, and, uh, I will say this about uh, okay, Goblet of Fire is better than I remembered. Um, okay. There is like a like twenty thirty minute stretch in the middle of the movie where um, it's all like about the Yule Ball, and that like perfectly captures the feel of like an awkward like middle school or high school dance, and <laughs> that stuff is very entertaining. And I'd kind of forgotten about that, so Goblet of Fire actually kind of rose a couple of spots on my list. Um, really? Order of the Phoenix, though, is just <laughs> not good. Oh, yeah, no. yeah. That movie, that movie is like a, a slog and it, it, it's, it's a shame because that book is fascinating and very weird and very interesting. And uh, it's the worst adaptation and it's the worst of the movies. It's just, it's just not, it, it, the plot of it is, like, just way too streamlined, and they eliminate everything, like, subtle and interesting from the book, and it, it's just... Uh, but you still think, like, 4 and 5 are still the doldrums? Yeah, well, 4 I would put, like, number, like, 6 of 8. I'd put, like, I think my official ranking was, like, I had uh, Order of the Phoenix was at the bottom, and, like, then Sorcerer's Stone, and then Goblet of Fire. But, yeah, those are, like, not the series' finest hour. Um, Half-Blood Prince, though! Still great. <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah. It, that movie, I that I think is like maybe the only one out of all of them that could actually be called like a great movie. That that movie is just a lot of fun. It's very yeah. funny. It's legitimately scary at times. It's got this focus where it needs to be. And like the romance subplots are also I great. Care. <laughs> yeah, we, we really, it, yeah, you really make you care. That one is great. Um, Deathly Hallows Part 1. 
Uh, more scattershot than I had remembered, but still very good. It's, it's like, I describe it as like, it's a grab bag of a movie, but like, what a grab bag. Like, it's got, it's got a lot of good stuff. The su- the set pieces are fun. It's got a gorgeous, like, animated segment in the middle. It's got great location shooting. It's, it's a nice, like, change of pace. Um, okay. Deathly Hallows Part 2, it doesn't play as well as it used to, but, um... Like, the, the stuff that works in it, like, really does work. Like, there's a sequence in there where they, like, explain Snape's backstory, and that sequence is just transcendent. It's as good as anything in any of the other movies. On the whole, it's a little bit of a, I don't know, it, it feels a bit, like, out of, I don't know. A lot of it is just, like, giant CGI things, like, smashing at each other, and that can get a little exhausting. Too much dessert. Yeah, and also just, like, it, it's it's preposterous. It seems preposterous in hindsight that we ever thought this series like wouldn't have a happy ending. Like there were yeah. times like before the last book came out when everybody was kind of like like is Harry gonna die? Like is this gonna be just like a super grim ending? And like no, of course not. It's the Hollywood ending, and that's fine. It 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 does feel like not entirely like of a piece with the rest of the series because like. Half-Blood Prince and uh, Deathly Hallows are dark books. Like, they are very grim and very dark and very kind of just Harry grappling with, like, his own mortality and, like, the people, like, like the ghosts of yeah. his past. And, and there's a, there is a real sense of, like, sacrifice will be necessary. Yeah. yeah. And then the movie is just, and then the ending of it is just kind of like, eh, hey, it all works out. Like, 19 years later, he's got a happy family, everything's fine. I guess, you know, she earned the right to do that ending, but I think that ending is maybe not the not the ending it should have had. Yeah, I... This is, this no, is something I, I recognize I, I in hindsight, speak. but... I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a Harry Potter scholar. <laughs> <laughs> That's Harry Potter. I don't know. The, the, the book series is still, like, a perfect thing that I will hold on to until the end of time. Uh, the movies are definitely more of a mixed bag, but I enjoy them a lot. So that's that. I think I can uh, c- close the book on that and say Harry Potter is still something very near and dear to my heart. And uh, okay. that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, anyway, that's what I have been watching. So shall we talk about some Kieslowski films? Oh, I would love to. Alrighty. What shall we talk about first? Um... Reed, which one should we talk about first? Um, let's talk about the more interesting one. Which th- one is that? I think our opinions are going to vary. Uh, let's start with Blind Chance, and then okay. we can move into the double life of oh. Veronique. Blind okay. Chance. Um, this movie starts with we go into a screaming man's mouth <laughs> on a plane. <laughs> yes. That's we, the beginning. Yes, we open uh, on a man, uh, his eyes wide, his mouth wide open, screaming, no! Pol- Polish for and, no. And, and just push then, it to his mouth. Then we cut to a hospital where somebody is getting dragged through the floor and blood is trailing behind them. Yes. And, um, and then, then what happens after that? Okay, so we get like a montage of, like, the the main character's, like, life leading up to uh, where the narrative actually starts, I think. Um, yes. yeah, yeah, kind of. You see him, like, kind of learning to write and, like, his kind of, like, first romances and things like that. You And him, like, progressing through medical school. Um, a lot of, like, people looking into the camera. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's done, it's shot in a very interesting way where, it, like, it all, yeah. like, starts as a POV shot and then it'll kind of, like, move over and, like, you'll see, like, the person who's... POV it is supposedly is. Yeah. I yeah, like that. Really camera work. It, I it, will say. I was fascinated by that. Sorry, I interrupted. Oh, no, that's fine. I, yeah, I, that's, I, I adore the camera work in this movie. Yeah, like, I adore yeah. Um, this, I, I adore this kind of stark, wide-angle world. Yeah. Anyway, it, it makes for a very disorienting way to uh, begin the movie, but uh, yeah. I, I like it. It, it. it is shot it's very well. It's kind of yeah, it is shot very well, and like it's it's a very it's very striking, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Like once you figure out what's going on, you're like, oh, okay, we're just like seeing glimpses of this guy's life. Like, what is what is this movie going to be exactly? Um, yeah. So a bit of historical background here, just before we dive in further. Oh my! So this movie was made in I think 1981, 
um, when Poland was still under communist rule, and the Polish government heavily censored it and suppressed it for years. I think it orig- it actually like first was released in 1987, uh, and then the full Which version was still under the communist government. Yes. But I think that was the censored version, and then the full version was restored uh, at some point later. I'm not sure exactly when, but yes, there. As you pointed out earlier, there is a point in this movie where like it kind of fades out, and it's like this is the only censored fragment that could not be restored. And we only have sound, and you just hear muffled the muffled sounds of a man getting beaten by police. Yeah. Uh. So this movie <laughs> follows uh. What's his name? Vitek. Vitek. Yes, a yes. uh, young Polish medical student who whose uh, entire life hinges on him catching or not catching a train, yeah, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you see, like, three different scenarios, like, based on what happens, like, with him catching this train to Warsaw, mm-hmm. and they, they, they vary wildly. And yeah. it's interesting. I will say this. My main issue with the movie is that They've written this character and like the way the way the movie is constructed is so that like he seems like extremely impressionable like based on like whoever he yeah. happens to run into he just kind of absorbs their ideology and then that kind of dictates the course of his life in in this film and I take yeah. a bit of issue with that just because that seems like a little I don't know just a little far fetched and kind of uh, n- not. Not weak writing, but like not not particularly strong writing of, of yeah, this character. I, I don't know. I kind of see that as like sort of there was something. I think I remember this was something written. I know this was Masha Gessen on sort of on like on the Russian on Russian opinion getting. Mm. Whereas like if it's on TV and there's like lots of people like and there's and that whereas like Russians will tell you whatever they see on TV. That's sort of like the, there's almost like this totalitarian mindset even though it's not a totalitarian state anymore. Mm-hmm. So like if like the TV's pushing like the anti-gay stuff and things like that, you're going to get some really horrific opinions mm-hmm. when you ask a uh, Russian populace. But when you ask them about things that aren't on TV, you can sometimes get like really liberal opinions. So like, and there is kind of like this, so like in these communist societies, there's like, there is no like private thought. Mm. There is no public opinion, Mm. to be honest. So what you get is that like, whatever, like somebody says to you, whatever you're being told through radio, through family, through friends, through TV, whatever, that is what's, that is what is correct. Mm. That it's sort of like, it, it, it also kind of, that also forms kind of like Soviet doublespeak. Yeah. So sort of whatever someone tells them, is correct okay and like and so like when he when he meets a priest that must be right when he meets the party Mm -hmm. that must be right when he meets the resistance to the party that must be right like okay you have to realize that like all the things he joins are like these like heavy organizations within themselves the resistance Mm -hmm. is an organization the party is an organization the church is an organization yeah and so, like, they are these things. Like, they are these things that, like, one can like listen to and like be involved in their grunt work. Okay, all right. I I guess I I can buy that. Um, I I, I, I sort of like my bit, but I still think like this is still kind of like we really don't get a true sense of this character. Like, he is just so mm. wide eyed, yeah. and impressionable. Like, right. if anything, he almost like becomes a tool of the movie more than like a, a character in his own right. Yeah, well, which is fine because like this movie is kind of like inherently like a cinematic experiment like this movie is very much about like the technique and the storytelling yeah. mechanisms of it I, I kind of call it like tales about communist poland yeah sort of like my what i would call it yeah well it's this like, it's just like a series of like the life in, a, in, the, in this communist government yeah well this this movie has often been compared to um another movie that's sort of similar in its structure have you ever seen um run lola run no i have not seen run lola Okay. I've heard quite a bit about that. Yeah, that just has like a similar thing where it like will kind of reset and then like t- tell another um like version of the story. That the variations in that one are much more slight um and yeah. somewhat subtle. Also that movie kind of grooves on like a video game kind of aesthetic a little bit um yeah. which this movie does not at all. Um, this this movie is very like we're going to like I think the the cinematic look of this movie is utterly fascinating. Like I'm, yeah. I'm honestly kind of shocked it was made in '81 because yeah. it just because like the images are just so crisp and like right. the lighting is just so severe and stark. Yeah, yeah, and 
like yeah, coming just... coming to this like right off of the Three Colors trilogy, like it's very striking because those movies are yeah. just so suffused with color and just so like entertaining and very. They have like kind of an an innocence of spirit about them a little bit, and like yeah. this movie is very grim and very gray oh, and yeah. very like serious and like has a lot on its mind about like the communist regime and and that sort of thing. Yeah, which I'm honestly kind of shocked this thing was even released at all in 87. <laughs> just, like, how, like, anti-communist it seems to be in subtext. So I don't, mm-hmm. like, well, that's the thing about, like, it shows, like, these, like, communist resistance characters, but I, the movie kind of doesn't really side with them. Yeah, well, the it movie... kind of shows them as, like, another, like, monolithic organization. Yeah, okay. So, like, the, the threads of the movie is, like, the first time he, like, meets this, like, old like, member of the party on the train and then kind of becomes sucked into the communist uh, party and, like, the mechanisms yeah. and becomes, like, a figure, like, within it. Um, at the same time, he's reconnecting with, like, uh, a, an old love from his past. Yeah. Um, and she's, like, kind of a member of the opposition. In the second one, he, like, jo- misses the train and gets sent to prison and beca- and joins up with the anti-communist movement. Yep. And then the third one is kind of like a smack it like between them like he uh misses the train again goes back to medical school ha- g- uh, finds a wife like has a family and just refuses yeah. to take any political stance at all and then yeah. it's fascinating because that like third iteration you're kind of like oh okay this is probably like the best case scenario for this guy he's got a wife who loves him he's got a family like things are going pretty well for him like with his career and then at the very end of the movie, he gets on this plane to like go give a lecture in, I think, Libya. And then the plane takes off and then the plane explodes <laughs> with him on it. So Which I think it's kind of like this, like this character can never find like re- resolution. Yeah. Which is like the thing about like these communist regimes, like you're not allowed to leave. You're not. Yeah. You can't travel within. It's very difficult. Like there's like barely any mobility mm. within it so, like your life is just like a series of like stops and starts mm. and so like whenever like Vitek tries to commit himself to something it just ends in disaster right and like the ultimate slap in the face when he tries to leave the plane fucking explodes <laughs> which is i get what you're doing there kieslowski but god that's hilarious <laughs> Yes, yes, Reed, you have a question. I have a follow-up to a John's comment. Um, well, that explains the opening shot. <laughs> yeah, that's because I, cause I, then, I, then I see the plane, I go, oh, <laughs> wow, that's still a wild way to open a movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it's got this, like, circular structure, but you're never aware it's a circular right. structure until you well, get, like, to, like, the last shot. Well, it's so strange, like, I mean... Even with that, I'm kind of like, like, Kieslowski, like, why would you choose to open the movie that way? It, like, it's very strange. Um, I thought this movie is very interesting. I l- was not, I didn't, like, super enjoy it. I, I was not, like, and I think this will be a, recor- a recurring thing. I was not, like, as, like, hypnotically absorbed by either of these movies, like, as much as I was by the Three Colors trilogy. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. I don't know. This movie has a lot of interesting things on its mind, and I would never deny that it's very innovative and very interesting. Oh, uh, certainly. The filmmaking, it, I think, is, like, is some of my favorite from Kieslowski so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm I'm not sure that it's one I'll come back to very often, because it is... Yeah. Man, this movie is a downer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this feels like the kind of movie I would make, these kind of, like, like ultra, like, cinematic, experimental, historical thing. Mm-hmm. But, like, the, I think the issue is, like, it just it just can't find concrete ground. Like, because, like, just as, like, the nature of it, like, mm-hmm. we have, like, like, a central character, but, like, you're right, he's just so impressionable, he's just so wide-eyed, it's just, it's hard to get really attached to him. Right. And, and so, like, what you have is, like, a character study that's not really about the character. Mm. And, like, you have a world that, like, constantly changes, but, like, I'm, the narrative isn't quite sure why it's always changing outside of, like, loose ideas of, like, Polish communism. Yeah. But, like, it, it's, it's a movie that, like, is, like, a really fascinating experiment, and I, and I, and I enjoy quite a bit of it as, like, a full, like, movie uh, I struggle to grasp anything from it. Yeah, yeah. And I I can sympathize with that. Yeah, it 
it's more interesting as like kind of an exercise and like uh, amusing on communism and Poland and I mean this this movie is very very Polish. It's very specifically oh, yeah. Polish and it grapples with a lot of interesting things. Like I after I watched the movie, I realized like okay, I know nothing about Polish history. I should look into this a little bit for some context. Um, yeah. It's 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 interesting uh, and like it looks great. Uh, the cinematography some, some of in it is some of these scenes fascinating. Are utterly arresting. Yeah, there. It's yeah. Kieslowski cannot make a movie, I think, without some kind of just arresting, fascinating imagery he, and he's scenarios. He's a master. I think we can't deny that. And this yeah. is like the sort of like not half baked, but sort of like sort of nebulous, like yeah. ramblings of a very intelligent filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. He, and, like, he that is, and that is fascinating, but not quite satisfying. Yes, I would agree with that. He, he tried something with this movie, and I'm glad it exists. Uh, oh, certainly. Like, I would. Like, if someone says, like, hey, should I watch this? I would say, yes. Yeah. Go and watch it. It's fascinating. Um, Reed, well, Reed, you didn't finish it, but, like, what were your, like, how much of it did you get to? Um, I didn't get very far. So, when I ended, um, the subtitles on the video, on the version I watched. Which was the Canopy version? Canopy version. Um, they were there streaming side to side seconds ahead when delivered and and like at the 20 minute mark it started like getting bad but like i was like it was all maybe like half a second or one second but i but it, but like i can still follow it and then it just slowed down and it's yeah this when was, you get subtitle issues you just can't watch the movie that's yeah. just like yeah that's like basic unless yeah. you speak um but like, i know i didn't really get that far but Vitek is an is an intriguing character, you know, based on hearing a conversation about you know the abusiveness of the party, and then he goes to join the party. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Vitek is like an interesting like concept for a character, but I think like fails to be a character in his own right just by like just via like the structure of the film because like his opinions and his motives are always those of others. Yeah. Yeah, he seems a very passive character. Intention- intentionally so. Like, this... <laughs> yeah. Like, that passivity of him is not, like, a pejorative. That's just a thing about... That's just, like, how the film is structured. Yeah. Yes. Which is fine, but makes for a, uh, him, like, a less interesting than he yeah. could have it, otherwise been. So the movie just kind of becomes a monolith after a while, but... Is, is that sort of our final thoughts? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd still recommend it. It's definitely worth seeing. It's There's no other okay. movie like quite like it, um, mm-hmm. which is going to be a recurring thing with it, these movies. But It is, ex- it is an experience, this yeah. movie. So I'd recommend it, but it is not what I think I'm going to come back to a lot, for at least for like full watching. I think there are like scenes from it that I would cite quite a bit, and like yeah. the look of it is something that I think I would adapt or like try to kind of... Yeah. But um, as a whole, it's not probably something I'm going to re- re- be revisiting like, a lot. There are scenes in this movie where, like, I do think are just like the purest distillation of Kieslowski. Yeah. But like, there's also like other stuff where I'm like, "What the fuck are you thinking?" But, <laughs> like, like I said, it's three parts brilliant, one part utterly confounding. Yeah. But Wait. let's talk about the double life of Veronique. Uh, let's. Okay, so this is 1991. The Double Life of Veronique. This was a, a co-production between Poland and France. This was just a couple of years after Poland had uh, been reinstated as a democracy, right? Yeah, they were a part of like the Velvet, all like the Velvet Revolutions of eighteen mm. um, of nineteen eighty nine, like yeah. Czechoslovakia, Poland. You get the fall of the Berlin Wall, so yeah, the yeah. Soviet bloc is crumbling. In nineteen ninety one, the year this comes out, the Soviet Union finally collapses. Right. Right. So, yes, so this was uh, his first movie kind of at least partially made outside of Poland. Uh, It was kind of his first, like, international sensation. Uh, It was, like, kind of a breakthrough for him in that regard. Um, So this movie follows uh, Irene Jacob of, uh, or uh, I'm I'm not even going to try to do the French pronunciation, the appropriate French pronunciation. Um, Veronica and Veronique. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have Irene Jacob of uh, Three Colors Red fame as both Ver- Ver- Veronica and Veronique, two identical citizens of Poland and France, respectively. 
Yes. Um, and uh, the movie basically follows uh, their exist their respective existential uh, crises. Uh, well, not crises, yeah. but meditations yeah. on life and uh, the universe and yeah. whatever. They are like two people sort of wandering around lost in their respective cultures. Mm. And so it is like looking out at the world and trying to make sense of it and finding none. Yeah. Especially, especially in like the Polish one. Mm. Can I say, so, so with Veronica, her bit in the story is quite confounding and it's very <laughs> yeah. short. Yeah. Mainly because, you know, she's a talented singer. She's sort of this underdog singer because she doesn't, she's not, she's not professional. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's just, She's just really good. And then she performs at a concert and then falls dead. God. And I was kind of shocked by that, to be honest, because I thought, like, okay, we're going to get, like, two people. All right. Uh, when is this? Oh, my God, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, the camera literally falls over. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I have a feeling it was, like, kind of constructed that way, at least in part because yeah. um, the, the actress didn't speak Polish and her voice was actually dubbed. So... Oh, so that may have been a part, but yeah. So you you start with where on with Veronica uh, in Poland, and yeah, about twenty five minutes in, she just dies on stage, and then you shift, and the rest of the movie is about uh, Veronique in France, and um, it, it's interesting. And okay, so this movie, like most of his it's movies, another kind of cinematic experiment. Yeah, and it looks great. Uh, the cinematography is by the same guy who shot Blue. Um, which is probably the best looking of the three colors movies, and except he, this one is more like suffused with like kind of greens and yellows in an interesting way. Yeah, it, yeah, like I said, like, it's kind of got like this like Jean Pierre golden glasses view of its respective nations. Yeah, there's like there's like I think there's like this like train ride like it's kind of like this like ultra like fish eye lens. Where like we get like this, go- we get like these golden like images of the mm. Polish countryside well, through a train. Yes, yes. Well, what it is is she's looking through that like clear like rubber ball, and yeah, so you're right. yeah, yeah. So you get like it all filtered through that, which is so interesting and looks uh, very hallucinatory and um, and and gorgeous. Yes. Yeah, like, there, there's a, there's a all there's a bunch of like viewing things through other things. Yeah. <laughs> To put it in an uneloquent fashion. Yeah, so I guess my my main thing with this movie is um it, it, it like I say, it looks great. It's very it's a very kind of interesting, like just kind of meditation on like life and um yeah. fate and whatnot. I kind of got to the end of it and I was like, okay, what was the point of all that? <laughs> yeah, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of like watching it and I'm thinking, you know, Kieslowski. I'm an adult. I don't believe in fate. <laughs> I kind of believe that, like, like, humanity is just, like, an accident. <laughs> and, like, I don't believe we're connected like this. I think it's, like, the world is a mess. <laughs> okay, so you, you were, you, a nihilist, were put off by the, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just kind of like, you know, I really don't believe. <laughs> the, the sense of human, the... You were put off by the beautiful sense of human connection that this movie presents. Yeah, yeah, yeah like I mean, like I, I get like why he did is like especially like these are this is still something that's kind of controversial now is like the integration of Eastern Europe into like this greater European project. Uh-huh. Like one of like an image that came out of like I, I remember like there was a there was like a display at OSU and trying to highlight like the immigrant experience and one of the images they had was like this image from like london that just said fuck off polish scum oh so like and there's like there is kind of like this animosity in like western europe towards like these newer members of this european community Mm. from the east so like i can certainly like i certainly see like the symbolism and like the importance of like we have like these two characters who are from two different parts of europe who are the same you, the east is the west, and the west is the east. We are all Europa. Yeah. And like, and I understand that. I get that. But like, the issue is, is kind of like, I really don't know what else he's trying to say out of that. Well, because I didn't even get that until like, kind of, you brought it up. Because like, it is so yeah. buried in the subtext of the movie that I was just yeah. kind of like, uh. Yeah, and the, well, that's just, it's just a strange kind of thing. Like, we sort of 
and granted, like, there were, like, some fascinating, like, images in the movie, like, where they, like, look at each other. Mm-hmm. Like, one, I think it's, it's, Veronica looks at Veronique. Yes. In the bus, like, looking out at, like, this, like, it, I think it's just, like, a, it's, like, a protest. Like, I don't know what year this movie's supposed to take place in. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like there was a point that I'm, like, is this the parent trap? It's, like, what? <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> This is a confound. I think this is one of the more confound. I think this is the most confounding movie I've seen from him. Because like, mm. because like, with like blind yeah. chance, like there are like these heavy groundings in like communist ideology, right? Whereas this, I'm like far more like, okay, where are we going here? Yeah, that was something I was going to bring up. I think this movie is maybe like too elliptical, like kind of for its own good. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it. There's a lot of, in- there, there's a lot of interesting things that we've been to this movie and weave out and weave back in uh specifically with the uh, notions of puppetry mm-hmm. of yeah of of who controls life and then just yeah. that puppet master which is all dick. great by the way <laughs> they uh they have the the great puppeteer uh bruce schwartz doing the the marionettes uh, that's all good yeah, stuff the marionettes are fascinating and like i like and like the, the sort of how they like parallel like the story of veronica like there and there's sort of like and there again like there's more ideas of like art inspiring life inspiring art yeah. etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think that's all fascinating but like yeah and like yeah the puppeteer is a dick who sends people on in circles <laughs> like trying to like trying to find material dick. for his He's new book. Dick. He's and also like, a rapey dick. So yeah, like I I think like what we're coming out here is like I don't think we like quite agree with like the philosophical underpinnings of the film. Well, I just like I I wasn't even like kind of sure what the psycho the philosophical yeah. underpinnings of the film were. Like I was just kind of watching it, going like, "Where is this going? What well, are you it's saying?" Like, it's, it's like the it, it, it is kind of like the life and fate. <laughs> Aren't we all connected? It's, it's kind of like if like Red just went on like a new wave binge, and then <laughs> this is what came out. Well, or like if Red like refused to like be like have like like solid relationships at its center, and was like just kind of like like if you remove the judge from Red, yeah. Uh, which, which would which remove is, the core of the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is like, that's yeah. the most fascinating part. So it's it, it kind of what you get is like this fascinating, beautiful, like aimless piece. Yeah. And I can't say it's without merit because like it is gorgeous. Like some of these ideas really are fascinating. Like some of the characters are fascinating. I kind of do like the, the East is West, West is East. We are all connected by Europa and like with these red scarf, short hair women. <laughs> we. We. Um, yeah, and, and and of course, like I, I just kind of adore it's like visions of Poland and France, respectively. Yeah. Uh, Read anything to add? I just have a general comment about Kieslowski. We could probably save that like towards the end. Well, I think we're we're, we're pretty much yeah. done here. <laughs> we're pretty much, I think, is like we we really, I, I kind of really don't have too much to say about it. It's kind of yeah. a thing that like it's beautiful, it's lyrical, it's got like a bunch of ideas, but like it just kind of. None of it really sticks to you, for my sake, for my taste. Yeah, it just, I don't know, it, it's just, it's, if you have something to say, like, just say it, I feel like yeah. that's, yeah. that's something yeah. I struggle with a lot, and, um, you know, this movie I just think was just kind of too, like, dancing around its, like, grand philosophical ideals for me to really, truly connect to it, but that's that. It, though granted, it's also like worth saying that like red is my least favorite of the like three colors trilogy. But I love red, so I I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah. I still really want to see the Decalogue. Uh, but Reed, say what you're yeah. going to say about Mr. Kieslowski. Oh yes, um, it's tangential to everything we just said. Um, there's a lot of fucking in this. <laughs> in oh yeah, like that's he'll show you people fucking. And some UFB also. <laughs> 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 I mean, like, there's um, one scene where like Veronica is in her underwear. I'm like, get some clothes on. <laughs> I don't need this, Kieslowski. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm not putting that in the title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Anyway, all right. But uh, you know, for all this, we still really uh, respect and admire uh, Mr. Christoph yeah. Kieslowski. Um, like I say, I really would like to see the Decalogue at some point. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, uh, 
Yeah, he he is a master, and you know we we do kind of bow at his feet, even though these movies left us a bit cold. These movies are still some of the most gorgeous things we've seen on this podcast. Yes, absolutely. So, boys, what are we going to do next week? Well, uh, I think you had figured it's about time for that Korean cinema episode we've talked right. about for a while. For that. So, Snowpiercer and Old Boy. Yes, I think we will start off with uh, Snowpiercer and Old Boy. And this is rather timely, actually, because uh, two people uh, just yesterday, like in the same day, recommended uh, Bong Joon Ho's new Netflix movie to me. So, okay. Um, I may end up watching that at some point this week, um, depending. I'll see if I can seek it out somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. All right. So, Snowpiercer, uh, Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer, and Park Chan-wook's Old Boy uh, will be coming your way next week. We, we venture to the peninsula as it is ready to blow itself up. Uh, yeah, pretty much. All right. Thank you for joining us. We hope we'll still be here <laughs> next week. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's just not healthy to ponder nuclear annihilation. There's just, there's just nothing... I, I guess I kind of feel like what people likely did in the 60s, where it's like, oh, the world's going to end. I kind of feel free right now. Sure. Okay. There's, there's, All right. there's kind of no reason to worry about it. Alrighty. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Warner. <laughs> I don't think Warner's ever talked about comics on the show, has he? Oh, yes, oh. he has, many times. Where have you been? <laughs> I, thought that, well, I thought that was within the realms of our comic book episode. Well, yes, they were, uh, like, related to, like, things that we were talking about, but he, he, he would still... Well, the fact... He brought up that uh, long-winded story about how X-23 worked as a prostitute in the comics when we talked about Logan. <laughs> oh my god, you're right. Fuck. I am back in silhouette. Ooh, but they can't see you, Whoa. so it doesn't matter. Yeah. We, um, we can't see you. This I like to is... think this is a compelling image. You got the sort of Dutch angle going on. You got the blown out window. You got the they got the sort of warm yellow light in the background. I, I think it's tell yourself that. Okay. <laughs> this is John dissecting the cinematography of his Google Hangout call. Um, hey, 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 I, I can see impeccable cinematography wherever it lies. Uh, has I'm offered trying you. to make a commercial look good at the moment. Oh, good. Are you ruining the podcast? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, John has exited the frame. Oh. That's the appropriate music. <laughs>